Welcome. So uh, this is a sort of non-standard talk. It's a, a talk on a kind of trade or textbook to a scholarly audience. So I had to think a little bit about how best to, to use our time. Should I you know, bring in some extra technical terminology that's not even in the book, or what should I do? Uh, ultimately, I decided to proceed like this. So first, I'll explain sort of uh, my motivations for writing the book and some of the goals that I have for it. Um, then I'll provide a kind of structural overview, followed by a kind of deeper look at two of the chapters, the first two chapters in the book. Then, because the book is pitched to a trade audience, I'll talk a little bit about some of the ways I engage that audience. And then finally, I'll at least mention uh, what I hope to be some of the contributions the book will make to the primary literature, despite its trade orientation. Okay, so this is a book about intellectual virtues, roughly the character traits of excellent thinkers, in particular the cognitive traits of excellent thinkers. So it focuses on traits like curiosity, intellectual carefulness, intellectual autonomy, humility, honesty, intellectual perseverance, intellectual courage, open-mindedness, and the like. Uh, the book actually began its life as a paragraph in the teaching statement that I wrote when I won in the academic job market. Everybody has to write these things. Uh, writing that statement got me asking questions like this. Ultimately, what do I hope for my students? What does a successful education really amount to? And you know, as I was writing this teaching statement, okay, the first thing you've got to say, knowledge, right? There are some things that educated people are just expected to know. But of course, having a lot of knowledge doesn't suffice for having a complete education, right? So people can have a lot of knowledge, but not have any clue really how to put it together, or be very bad at reasoning their way to new knowledge, or, or just bad at reasoning in general. Further, uh, today's knowledge in many fields is going to be out of date tomorrow. So I think in addition to knowledge as an educational goal, we ought to add skills, in particular, skills in logical reasoning and critical thinking. But uh, this still, right, even the conjunction of these doesn't suffice for a complete education. Uh, and here's why. Logical reasoning skills can be used uh, in the service of any number of different ends. So surely to discover truth and to uncover falsehood, but also to justify unjustifiable positions, to mask substantive mistakes with slick rhetoric, or just to embarrass those whose logical reasoning isn't quite as good as one's own. So as I came to think of it, uh, I started to see that we need something else right, to add to the mix here for a complete education. And I think at least a good bit of that is to be found in the intellectual virtues that I mentioned a moment ago. So it's with that central thought in mind that I set out to uh, work on this project. And uh, after a while, what I began to see was that these same virtues that are relevant toward a complete education are really relevant much more broadly, right, for several different areas of our lives. So that's why I envisioned the book as reaching an, an even broader audience, hopefully, than a, a, just a, an audience of students. Okay, so four goals. So first, I want to show that these virtues are relevant to uh, good thinking in a number of uh, different areas of life including um, individual success, however one defines it, personal relationships, responsible citizenship, and education. Right? So intellectual virtues are relevant to all of those things. Second, I hope to motivate readers, at least in some way, to seek growth in intellectual virtues. And I do that uh, largely by providing uh, narratives of intellectually virtuous people doing their intellectually virtuous things, and on the negative side, providing sort of cautionary tales of epistemic vice. I also want to provide readers with a vocabulary for thinking about thinking, and in particular what it means to be a good thinker. Finally, I'd like to get readers in touch with authors who will help their further thinking about intellectual virtues. So I'm thinking of people like Linda Zagzebski, uh, Robert Robertson, Jay Wood, Jason Baer, uh, Rosalind Hursthaus, Daniel Russell, Ron Richhart, uh, Shari Tishman, uh, among many, many others. Okay, so now a, a kind of overview of the book, just structurally speaking. Uh, so this is the, the table of contents over the next few slides. So I start out kind of uh, 
critical issues to engage the reader. Why, why do we care about this? Uh, why does good thinking matter? And how are intellectual virtues relevant to, to good thinking? I address that in uh, chapter one. And after that, I zoom in a little bit and provide some kind of uh, framework fundamentals about what these virtues really are. I didn't want to give the, you know, all the definitions of the virtues um, in chapter one and then have people not read anymore. So I kind of provide a little motivation up front and then zoom in. Um, from there, the next nine chapters are about individual virtues, uh, starting with motivating virtues like curiosity and carefulness. Uh, at least as I think of it, curiosity is the virtue that impels us toward truth and knowledge, whereas carefulness uh, repels falsehood and um, irrationality. Uh, from there, we kind of move inward. This taxonomy is more pedagogical than it is uh, a taxonomy that tries to carve these virtues at their theoretical joints. But some virtues that are important for self-regulation, autonomy, humility, honesty, uh, perseverance, and courage. Uh, please take you know, intellectual in front of all those as, as red. Just didn't want to pronounce it that many times. That would get. <laughs> OK, and then once we've dealt with the kind of inward looking virtues, some outward looking ones, open mindedness and firmness, along with fair mindedness and charity. Uh, the book wraps up with some fairly standard uh, kind of Aristotelian suggestions about how to grow in virtue, but uh, at an intellectual uh, level or an intellectual um, sort of sphere of activity. OK, so I thought it might help to, to zoom in a little bit on chapters one and two. Chapter one is about why good thinking matters and about how intellectual virtues are relevant to good thinking. So key, key claim in chapter one is that intellectual virtues aren't just for bookworms. So to appreciate the, the practical importance of the points, it'll help to consider the relevance of intellectual virtues to several different areas of life. Uh, so start with success. Um, so this is the part of the book where I do a bait and switch on anyone who was hoping for an easy you know, self-help uh, book. So right, we all want to be successful in life. Uh, but what does that really amount to? What does it mean to live a good life? And how do we go about living one? Of course, everyone in this room uh, has spent a long time asking these questions. Uh, maybe some readers, not so much. But if you spend any time at all asking and trying to answer these questions, then you know that they're difficult questions, right? Figuring out answers to them is a substantive intellectual task. If we're going to protect ourselves against aimlessness and failure as we try to seek success in life, we'll need to think carefully about these questions. We'll need to think wisely about what's worth wanting in life. We'll need to think cautiously about um, ways in which we might fail. Uh, we'll encounter all kinds of obstacles to our thinking about success and our achievement uh, in the, the area of success. So uh, we'll need perseverance. Uh, so right, I mean, there's much more to say here. Uh, but the upshot is that I think if we're going to think uh, reliably, consistently, uh, and purposefully about success, we'll, we'll need to think well, which means I think uh, we'll need to pursue intellectually virtuous habits of mind. All right. What about loving relationships? So there's this common refrain right, in obituary notices that living a good life requires having loved others well, particularly perhaps one's family and friends. Now, at least at first, uh, for many readers, it'll be tempting to think that that kind of love reduces to a kind of emotion, maybe a, a, a warm feeling or something like that. But as we all know, warm feelings don't count for much unless they result in actions that are actually loving. And loving actions often require careful thought. So when we consider what it means to love others well, we really can't avoid the topic of good thinking. It's not like these two things can somehow be mished together, mishmashed together with some kind of artificial glue. Uh, rather, I think that loving others well right, includes uh, thinking well about how to treat them. So to make this point more vivid, it might help to imagine ourselves in a difficult situation, maybe confronting a friend uh, who's an alcoholic right, about habits that are destroying uh, her life, or making a difficult end-of-life decision for uh, a parent, or helping a child make a decision 
about where to attend college. Lots of us will find ourselves in these kinds of situations. Um, what kinds of habits of mind do we want at our disposal when we arrive? Um, I think once you ask the question, the answer is, is pretty apparent. We'll want good thinking habits, right? We'll want to be able to think um, carefully, thoroughly, and wisely in order to make good decisions for our loved ones and to help them make good decisions. We'll need to know how to weigh evidence for and against various claims. We'll need to be able to do that with care. We'll need to be humble enough to know when our own cognitive resources aren't up to the task of helping with a decision, right? So a, a good thinker, an excellent thinker, knows when to ask for help from others. If we don't have the intellectual virtues, or at least if we haven't grown in them, I think we'll be less confident that we're going to make these decisions well on behalf of our loved ones. We can no more turn on good habits of mind than, say, a baseball player should expect to hit home runs having never taken batting practice. Right? These, these aren't just habits that you can turn on and off. To think well consistently, uh, especially in challenging situations, requires growth in these virtues, requires uh, good habits of mind. Um, notice, though, that it's not just when it comes to momentous decisions that these virtues are relevant. Think about your everyday routine. Right? Loving action in the day-to-day -day contains an intellectual component. And so I'll just put myself on the hook here for a moment. Right? So last week, was I attentive to the fact that my wife had a migraine and needed extra help with uh, our children? Was I fair in responding to my younger daughter's reasons for wanting another scoop of ice cream? Uh, probably not. <laughs> Did I persevere in seeking a creative idea for my older daughter's birthday invitations? Uh, have I been humble enough around other parents to admit that when it comes to parenting, a lot of the time I'm just kind of making things up as I go along? Uh, have I been courageous in confronting my friend about his tendency to bully his coworkers? Right, on and on. Right. Uh, well, I'm not going to answer all those uh, questions. Uh, that might get embarrassing. But if, if you start to ask yourself similar questions, I think you'll start to see the importance um, not only of good thinking but of these intellectual virtues in everyday life. Uh, loving action requires good thinking, at least uh, regularly and as a matter of course, and consistently thinking well at least if we're going to be intentional about it, uh, requires virtuous habits of mind. All right, responsible citizenship. So here's where we can extend that point about loving action kind of outward from our families and friends uh, to society as a whole. So we, we all want, or at least we should want, to be responsible citizens. Uh, at the founding of the American Republic, Thomas Jefferson observed that the basis of our governments is the opinion of the people. Our beliefs largely determine our voting behavior and the rest of our civic activity, and our intellectual character plays a major role in the beliefs we form. So just think about some of the problems that we face uh, just in the United States today. Racial tensions, poverty, uh, terrorism, pollution, blue collar crime, white collar crime, um, religious bigotry, unemployment, immigration debates, health care woes, diminishing education rankings, uh, corrupt politicians, um, right, just to name a few. Uh, if we want to make a dent in problems like these, again, right, this is, there's a reason this is a, re uh, a refrain, we'll need to think well. We'll need thinking that's careful, creative, attentive, wise, and courageous. And as we seek to solve our society's problems, and this is where more virtues come in, our discussions will inevitably yield controversy. To navigate those controversies well, we'll need to think in ways that are open-minded and charitable and fair-minded and, and the like. We'll also need to think in ways that are actually firm so that we don't just cave at the first sign of controversy. Uh, this kind of thinking, though it involves intellectual virtue, it's, it's far from a merely academic exercise. Uh, though intellectual virtues are highly relevant to education, uh, as we'll see next. So earlier I said that my main reasons for writing these, this book or, or getting started on it had to do with uh, what I was hoping for my students, and what I was thinking a complete education involved. And I think, in a way, my own reflections on these issues kind of parallel the national conversation. Uh, in particular, I'm thinking of 
Andrew Del Banco's work in his book, College, What It Was, Is, and Should Be. So in that book, uh, Del Banco developed several arguments for attending college. Um, as a college professor, he hopes to remain employed, so he needs to convince people, you know, keep coming. Um, his central argument focuses on the well-being of the college graduate. You should go to college, he says, because it will help you flourish as a person. And in stating the, the key premise of his argument, Del Banco recalls this remark from his Columbia colleague, Judith Shapiro. She says, you want the inside of your head to be an interesting place to spend the rest of your life. <laughs> well, uh, to be such a place, right, a mind has to take on certain characteristics, or at least it's more likely to, to uh, be an interesting place if it takes on those characteristics. Um, Del Banco identifies five. So first, a skeptical discontent with the present, informed by a sense of the past. Second, the ability to make connections among seemingly disparate phenomena. Third, an appreciation of the natural world, enhanced by knowledge of science and the arts. Fourth, a willingness to imagine experience from perspectives other than one's own. And then finally, a sense of ethical responsibility. Um, now, though Del Banco doesn't use the language of intellectual virtue, I think this kind of language helps to clarify what he's after, what he wants for his students. So consider the list. Uh, the first item there seems well characterized by a kind of intellectual caution, perhaps with a kind of humble respect for tradition. The second seems like a matter, a matter of intellectual attentiveness and carefulness, while the third suggests curiosity and the love of knowledge. The fourth strongly, I think, suggests virtues like open-mindedness and fair-mindedness. Okay, so uh, one way to put this, um, and I'm, I think I'm, I'm only tweaking this slightly, is that Del Banco thinks the best reason to go to college is that it can help change your character, in particular, your intellectual character. Those who do so, right, those who take on these characteristics, ensure that they become lifelong learners. And that's something that I think all teachers aspire, uh, aspire to for their students. Okay, so that's a little bit about what I do in chapter one. In the second chapter, I provide a little more detail about what these intellectual virtues are. Right? So having uh, shown or at least made some kind of case that they're important, uh, what are they? Um, a lot of this will be familiar uh, to many of you. So first, uh, they're, they're dispositions, kind of multifaceted dispositions involving uh, our thoughts, right, the way we think, our motivations, and our actions. Right? So an intellectually virtuous thinker believes that knowledge is valuable, right, that truth is valuable, that falsehood and irrationality should be avoided. Uh, she's motivated to pursue knowledge and to avoid falsehood. And that motivation issues in actions, right? actions for the sake of uh, the truth, uh, for the sake of knowledge. Uh, another feature of many of these virtues is that they're means between extremes. I'm not sure that all of them are. In fact, I'm, I'm pretty sure that some of them are not. Uh, but those of you who are familiar with uh, Aristotelian moral vir virtues uh, and familiar with virtue epistemology will know about this kind of tendency people have to model intellectual character virtues on Aristotelian moral virtues. So this is all very familiar, right? Uh, the virtue stands between a vice of deficiency and a vice of excess. So for instance, perseverance stands between irresolution and intransigence. Uh, this is, I think, a, a good start. A, a lot of students uh, and, and others seem to find this kind of helpful. It gets them out of binaries like this. Oh, either you're you know, courageous or you're cowardly, right? And those are the only kind of options. It helps them to see, you know, there are, there are problems in more than one direction. Um, I think charts like this, um, this kind of tripartite um, schema for the virtues can be helpful, but we want to go further than that, right? These, these are at best a good start. Um, Rosalind Hursthouse argues uh, in a paper that, uh, that Daniel Russell pointed to me at the previous Beacon Project conference uh, that this kind of account just doesn't tell us enough, right? If we're just looking for the right amount of activity or emphasis in a given area, uh, for one thing, that doesn't tell us why these virtues are excellent. Right? 
doesn't give us an account of that. It also doesn't tell us how practical wisdom, the, the virtue that, that unifies all other virtues, uh, makes its judgments and determinations. For that, I think we need uh, another image, and this is also from Aristotle, the image of the target, right, or the, or the archer. So here we can see curiosity depicted, um, right, as, um, as a, a narrowly focused target that avoids mistakes in all different directions, right? If you're shooting in an arrow, you can miss in any number of directions. Uh, so, so if someone's intellectually courageous, she won't just engage in any intellectual project um, with any motive, using just any means, on just any occasion. She'll undertake the right kinds of intellectual projects. So maybe cancer research or astronomy, but not you know, random phone number memorization or, or gossip mongering. Um, she'll choose the right objects of study. She'll also undertake her projects with good motives, maybe um, to achieve knowledge or understanding or uh, something like that, uh, not to get rich or impress others, at least certainly not primarily. primarily. And she'll undertake her projects on the right occasions, so she won't procrastinate on um, you know, some experiment that's pressing in order to start a writing assignment that's not due for another two or three years, right? She'll, she'll be sensitive to the right occasions. In short, she'll think wisely in order to discern which projects should be taken on and by what means and for how long. She'll do this uh, with truth, knowledge, and understanding among her motives. All right, so that's a bit about chapters one and two. Uh, the next nine chapters provide sort of portraits of individual intellectual virtues. I'm not obviously going to go through those right now. What I thought I could do instead is say a little bit about um, some strategies they use for engaging this popular audience. Uh, the first is narrative. Right? Um, I do my best to toggle back and forth between philosophical exposition and narrative. Right? So it's one thing you know, to do what we philosophers like to do, give a definition of you know, intellectual perseverance in tidy, necessary, and sufficient conditions. Right? That's one thing. Um, it's another to uh, give a sense of what that virtue looks like in action. Um, so vignettes right, involving intellectual virtue are really the first strategy here. Um, and I'm just going to mention a few of these. Uh, I've got a couple dozen in the book. Uh, so this is Helen Tausig. She's the founder of pediatric cardiology. Um, how many have heard of her? Pretty fascinating figure. So. Uh, she, when she was um, a young child, Tausig uh, contracted tuberculosis, and this ended up keeping her out of school for about half the time uh, during her, um, her early education. Right? So right there, kind of an obstacle to learning. Uh, then her mother died. Then, uh, as she uh, discovered uh, looking back, um, she had learning disabilities, uh, later self-diagnosed as dyslexia. She persevered through all this, by, by really outworking her peers. Then it came time to apply for medical school, right? So this is years later. And she's just rejected time after time because uh, at the time of her application, hardly any medical schools were accepting women. She perseveres through all of that and basically begins founding this field, uh, pediatric cardiology, uh, only to discover uh, at the age of 31 that she's losing her hearing. Right? Imagine a vocation in which your job requires you to listen through a stethoscope and then losing your hearing. She develops all these ways around this problem and eventually uh, goes on to uh, a career that, that led her to be uh, the president of the American Heart Association. So this is just tremendous perseverance in action. Uh, we can see perseverance in other cases too. If you've read Ray Bradbury's novel, Fahrenheit 451, you're familiar with this kind of knowledge-preserving community that memorizes books line by line in order to preserve knowledge. Uh, if you're familiar with the suffrage movement, you know the perseverance that Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony needed to, uh, to show in order to disseminate their views. So notice we've got perseverance in three different uh, sorts of activity. One kind of inquiry, getting knowledge, another uh, keeping it, and another sharing it. Uh, William Lemessurier was uh, the lead 
um, engineer behind the Citicorp Tower in New York City. Um, as construction uh, was completed, it was discovered, or maybe this was a couple years after construction was completed, it was discovered that the tower had a major weakness that left it vulnerable to wind shear. And a storm of the strength that New York City gets once every 16 years <laughs> could have toppled the building and killed thousands of people. Uh, LeMessure admits the mistake and fixes it, um, though his career could have suffered tremendously as a result. Um, psychologists know uh, Michael Inslicht and the extent to which he has subjected his own work to public scrutiny in an attempt to make it more empirically rigorous. Um, and then lastly, Ruby Bridges as a monument to intellectual courage as she uh, seeks to achieve an education despite not only racism but physical threats. Okay, so that's the first strategy. A uh, second strategy uh, I try to employ throughout is just to remain even-handed, right? So uh, you all remember that time, right, that Donald Trump claimed to know more than uh, the generals did about uh, ISIS, right? So I do talk about that as an example of arrogance, but um, it's not a, a partisan vice, right? So um, the, the upshot here is that, um, right, to kind of paraphrase Alexander Solzhenitsyn, he talks about the line between good and evil cutting through uh, the middle of each of us. I think the same is true when it comes to intellectual virtue and vice, right? There, there aren't uh, um, virtues and vices, I think, that divide um, along political or, or religious lines, at least not in a tidy way. All right, uh, third, I work to ensure that, uh, that my material meets people where they are. So you're all familiar with uh, internet trolling, right? Um, just read comments sections uh, once in a while about controversial topics. Uh, people are concerned about this. People are concerned that the trolls are, are winning and ruining the internet. Uh, there's uh, political polarization, uh, fake news, and a kind of post-truth culture, at least some people think that way. Um, uncivil, civil discourse. These are issues that, that people are already thinking about, and intellectual virtues are highly relevant to uh, understanding what's going on, uh, so are intellectual vices. On the more positive side, people are thinking about traits like grit and uh, mindsets like uh, the growth mindset uh, that Carol Dweck has uh, made famous. I incorporate these kinds of elements as ways to help people think about some of the things uh, that are already on their minds. All right, a few contributions to the primary literature that I'll just mention and then uh, we'll move to discussion. So uh, I return to the target image as opposed to this uh, kind of simple tripartite scheme. I think that's a, a mild contribution, but hopefully it gets people thinking in a little more, um, I guess a little richer way uh, about some of these virtues. Uh, an emphasis not just on getting knowledge and inquiry, but on keeping it and sharing it. I think that shows that these virtues apply a little more broadly than um, some standard examples might suggest. Right. And then I do my best along the way to develop some novel insights about individual uh, virtues, uh, which I could talk about more in a moment. Okay, I think I'll stop there and I look forward to your comments and questions. Thanks. I will be taking a cue. Uh, so if you want to raise a question, go ahead and raise your hand and keep it up until I tell you to put your hand down. Also, I will be using a pattern that I learned here at a previous conference. If you have a follow-up question or comment, raise a single finger rather than a whole hand, and I you can kind of keep the thread going that way. Go ahead and raise hands. You can be first, and I'll take the rest of the queue. Thank you so much. Uh, that was great. Um, this is a very open-ended question. So this, you noted that the motivations for your project were primarily thinking about education of college students. And I, I wonder if you might, in, in, in that sense, intellectual virtue fits very naturally. You know, it says, what, what do we want uh, kids to have out of college education? I wonder if you might speak to how, how you think this might fit uh, with formation and moral virtues, if at all. Yeah. So this is uh, notoriously tricky territory. How do these things interact? Uh, I don't have much that's new to say um, on this, but I, what I will say is, 
Uh, right, going back to Hume, there's this sense that it's hard to pull these things apart. He says a lot of the virtues uh, that uh, we, we classify as intellectual really have this strong uh, effect on our conduct. So uh, whether we characterize these intellectual character virtues as a, as a proper subset of moral virtues or as somehow distinct from them, um, they're clearly related. Uh, one of the ways we can see that, I think, is by uh, thinking about loving action. Right? That, that's clearly morally relevant. Uh, but I think one's intellectual character, insofar as it, it tends to have a major effect on what one believes, um, that is clearly morally relevant as it guides us either toward loving action or, or away. So that may be a start. But uh, there's a lot of debate about how exactly kind of the subset relations work here. Yeah. The first person has passed on their spot, so I'll say Adam Pilsa, you're next. Yeah, I, I, that was a similar question I had. It was the question about the distinction between moral and intellectual virtues. It seemed like many of the you know, narratives that you were drawing on sound an awful lot like the, the, the traditional moral virtue being applied to some some intellectual context in some way or another. And I was just wondering how in the book you're, you're trying to distinguish those if you try very hard to sharply distinguish them or not. Yeah, well, I suppose one thing is that whatever else we say about the subset relations, for, for a virtue to qualify as an intellectual virtue, uh, it'll have to be motivated by a desire for truth and knowledge and understanding. So while many of the people uh, I referred to here, we're, we're also pursuing morally good ends. Um, among their other ends were knowledge. And sometimes they were pursuing knowledge, at least in part, for the sake of those morally good ends. Um, but I guess I'd say that, I mean, a, a key, if there is a distinction to be drawn here, uh, it's something like this. Intellectual virtues uh, require uh, a kind of orientation toward intellectual goods that it's not clear to me that all moral virtues require. I'd have to think more about that. But I think that would be the, that'd be the key hallmark there. Thank you. Let me first just say, I think it's really, this is an awesome project. I think it's great to have uh, things like this uh, for a lay audience. Uh, I need to see more stuff like that. Um, one thing that struck me at the beginning of your talk was you characterize intellectual virtues as traits of excellent thinkers. And my impression is that often in virtue epistemology, they characterize it uh, as traits of excellent inquirers. And, and like thinking is a broader activity than just in, inquiry. And inquiry is often, I, or it's aimed at things like truth and knowledge and understanding. And, um, whereas you might think thinking can sometimes have alternative aims. Like uh, you might think, in various uh, creative art forms that aim, you might, um, thinking is aimed at novelty or originality, uh, or with uh, certain mathematicians, they may be more concerned with developing like elegant and beautiful mathematical systems or um, something like that. So, it, but as, as the talk continued, and also in your response to the previous question, uh, you seem to want to characterize intellectual virtues more as uh, ones that have these intellectual ends, like truth and knowledge, the ends of inquiry. So were you thinking of them as, as broader than excellences of inquiry? Or, um... Yeah, well, certainly broader than excellences of inquiry, because there's, there's a lot more to uh, our orientation toward truth and knowledge and understanding than just inquiry. So for instance, uh, the, the, the maintaining of knowledge and the sharing of knowledge it, it would, would broaden it out. Um, it's an interesting question uh, when we get into the realm of, say, creativity um, in art. Uh, I, need to, I need to think more about this, honestly. Think about my colleagues in uh, the art department and the music department. Well, they're, they're at a university. <laughs> they're doing things that are challenging, and they seem to be intellectually challenging, but it's less clear that those things are geared you know, specifically toward truth, knowledge, or understanding. So I'm not quite sure um, what to do with those at this, at this point. In some cases, you know, representational art, there's a kind of depiction of reality that I think gets us in the neighborhood of intellectual virtues as I've talked about them before. Um, and maybe, you know, in, in non-representational art, 
um, there's a kind of proposition in the neighborhood, right? The, the artist is trying to make a point uh, to get some kind of claim across. But I'd like to think more about how exactly all that fits together. It's a great question. Yeah. Alfred. Yeah, thanks for that. It was really interesting. Um, perhaps this is covered by the existing virtues you mentioned, but I was wondering if there are intellectual virtues that promote um, intellectual virtue in others. So not just through passing on your knowledge to them, but by kind of encouraging them to be the right kind of inquirers. Right. Perhaps yeah. by developing the right kind of aesthetic environment that encourages them to inquire yeah. in the right kind of ways or something. Yeah, excellent. Um, curiosity might be sort of contagious in that way, or, or the love of knowledge. Uh, at least as I reflect on some of the teachers who really got me excited about learning, their their not or their uh, their love of their subject matter was was part of what drew me to uh, to that very subject matter. So that might be that might be one. And and so there, I don't know if it's that it's a particular virtue that's encouraging virtues and others, right? Um, so that one virtue is distinct from others, is, is leading to the others, so much as it's seeing a virtuous person in the way that they're um, interacting with their subject matter. But um, yeah, I guess curiosity is the first thing that comes to mind there. I don't know, did you have one in mind? Um, not especially, but just uh, in a former life of television reception, when you're interviewing people, yeah. it's kind of really important to be smiling and nodding as you go along because then they keep saying stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Whereas if you just like this, yeah. even if you're really interested in what they're saying, people just stay quiet. Yeah. So it doesn't seem like that's going to necessarily be captured by all the things you mentioned, but it is important for yeah. allowing people the space to you know, have their voices. Yeah, yeah. I wonder if that makes right. Well, so I don't. Um, pretend or maybe even aspire to give a complete list here. So I, I mean, if, if there is a virtue like that that's a character trait, um, I'd be glad for it to be you know, added. To follow up on that? Uh, just so I, I might just be saying things that people already know, but uh, so I think so other regarding epistemic virtues so as things that people have papers on. Um, yeah. So, so Julia Driver distinguishes them, you'll say, with epistemonial virtues. And I guess some of the examples that she gives are Things like the virtues that a, like a good teacher has. So that's maybe not necessarily curiosity, but it's, yeah. it may even involve being like a good presenter, like ha having a manner that allows you to engage people. Yeah, yeah, good. Okay. Whether we include them as other regarding intellectual virtues or as a separate class of testimonial virtues is an interesting question. But yeah. those might be the kind of examples that can be included. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And as you said that, I recalled. Uh, uh, Robert Roberts and Jay Wood have a nice chapter on intellectual generosity. Should be, yeah, another. So yeah, if you've got other regarding virtues in mind, um, like generosity, even charity might fit in there. Yeah. Tim Paul. Thanks, Nate. I had a question about some of the motivation you were giving for growth in intellectual virtues. One of the things you said was loving others well includes thinking well about them, and I thought to myself that seems a bit too strong. Uh, no matter what the includes means, maybe it's a necessary condition that you think well, maybe it's constitutive, part of my loving well is my thinking, includes my thinking well. In either case, those who for whatever reason can't think quite well would be, wouldn't be able to love well. And it seems to me that there are instances of people who can't think well for whatever reason, but do love well. When you think of the Christian tradition of the holy fools, yes. as they're called, they're called the holy fools, who um, lacked lots of intellectual ability, and yet were known for their love, Think of you know lots of other cases like this too. So I wonder if that's just too strong, or do you really mean that necessary condition for loving well is thinking well? Yeah, excellent. So I don't want to give the impression that it's required for uh, for loving well that you know uh, we all acquire uh, not only um, full degrees of these intellectual virtues, but also really um, impressive. Um, expressions of the virtues of the sort that would impress people in this room. Right? Um, so uh, the first thing I think to note is that though this, um, this intellectual component um, is often, if not always, um, present in loving action, it need not be the, thing, the kind of thing that's hard to figure out so that a kind of attentiveness might be uh, central. And it, and it may very well be that people who kind of might not score so high on an IQ test, say, 
could, could have attentiveness of that sort. Uh, another thing um, you could say here, this is an Aristotelian kind of thing, is that virtues are, are to some extent relative to individuals. So I think there's a way in which we can uh, strive for genuine excellence here without being exclusive of, of people who, for whatever reason, um, don't have certain cognitive abilities. So I think it's a great place to push. I think there are a few moves that can be made, uh, but I'd like to think more about it. So thank you. Alina. Thank you. This was really good. Um, I may be like building, I don't know, building or what, like the outside of what Tim was um, bringing about. It does seem like we have examples of people who like, I don't know what's the proper way of talking about it now, but like high, you know, autism spectrum, right? Like maybe there's no capacity to uh, emphasize and um, relate to people in, in like normal way, but have like high um, capacity for thinking. Um, so that does seem like the two situations come apart in a different way than, than self pointing um, to. And then also, um, I've always been bothered um, when I'm thinking of intellectual virtues by cases where a completely vicious person that's motivated by, you know, your 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 adverbial Nazi Nazi doctor, right? Yeah. Um, seems like very truth oriented, right? <laughs> um, very non-loving. Um, so it does seem like is there a bigger story that that we can tell basically about the yeah. relationship between these two? Yeah, yeah. good. Uh, so to the first, you know, to the, the case of, um, say, people with autism, um, that's a good case. I'd like to think more about that. Uh, my, an initial thought might be something like this. Um, suppose that's a counterexample to the claim that um, loving action always requires intellectual virtue. Um, suppose that's right. It may nevertheless be true that um, for most of us, uh, or for a lot of us, um, loving action involves as an important component that kind of uh, intellectual virtue. And that would, I think, be uh, important enough not to miss. Um, the, let's see, what was the, the second point? Oh, the second point about the, the sort of um, intellectually virtuous Nazi or something like that. Yeah, lots of different ways you could go there. If you have a really strong unity of the virtues thesis so that um, intellectual virtues and moral virtues um, are united in such a way that you can't have uh, one without having all of them, well then you'll just say that that Nazi's not even um, intellectually virtuous. Another thing you could say, uh, this is I think what um, Bob Roberts and Jay Wood say, is well, um, that individual could be exhibiting uh, virtue in one sphere of activity, but not be virtuous on the whole. Right, so that, that would be a way of going that denies the unity thesis, or at least very strong versions of it. But I think it's coherent to say that a person acted um, in a way that was virtuous in one, you know, in one sphere, um, but not virtuously on the whole. Or, or a better way to put it might be acted excellently according to one measure, but not excellently on the whole. So I think there are moves to make there, but uh, it's a good kind of case. Uh, follow up? Yeah, I don't know. Sure, you can you can follow up. Short though. Okay, <laughs> short follow up. Do you think that whichever way you go will affect the strategies um, for um, instilling virtue? So, like, whichever way you would approach, will that have practical implications? It's not clear to me that it will, uh, because I mean I think we'd all want to say that. Um, Ultimately, right, in terms of, um, say, raising a child, we would want that person to achieve not just intellectual virtue but also moral virtue. So I would hope that in whatever kind of, um, whatever kind of way you go theoretically, there'll be enough kind of moral virtue education, uh, as it were, to, to steer people away from becoming, you know, Nazi researchers, say. Final question goes to Charlie. All right, th uh, thank you. Um, one thing I noticed early on is that you refer referred to uh, intellectual virtue and thought, motivation, and, and action. What, what about the role of perception in, in intellectual virtue? Excellent. Yeah, 
Uh, do you mean just sense perception, or are you talking about sort of judgment? Um, I mean, I mean it in a more robust way than something as simple as sense perception, but yeah. something that's distinct from something like uh, explicit thought. Right. So a, a kind of um, a awareness, however implicit, of kind of what's what's going on. Uh, awareness of what's important in a situation. I mean, is that the sort of of, of what's important, or even attending to it? I mean, some some examples that seem actually more relevant to intellectual virtue are often discussed in literature on uh, on moral failing, where somebody simply doesn't see that there's a moral situation at hand. And that seems to be an an epistemic problem because it, it, it they never have a chance to act morally because they they don't recognize that it's there. Yeah. Um, so one way to to go here, I don't. Uh, get into this in, in the book, but uh, one way to go is to think that that kind of perception is partly constitutive of uh, practical wisdom of the sort that helps us uh, to, um, you know, to sort of um, keep the virtues uh, in line, keep our activities in, in different spheres consistent with each other, um, attend to what's salient um, and, and the like of that. So I, I guess I'd be inclined to see that sort of perception as, as a part of phronesis. We'll call it a day there. Thank you.